Hey guys, hope you're doing well and you've had a good week. Today's Friday, just here to pick up some bolts and fastenings for the new job we're starting next week. Um, as you guys might have already seen, uh, Mark and the boys were pouring the concrete pad the other day. So obviously the kit's been delivered now and what one of the processes we need to pick up the fastenings from connect us down here in Tarapa and drop them off to site. So yeah, we'll go down and grab the screws and um, see what we can find. All right guys, so if, if you've watched the previous video we did at Connect, this is where we keep all of our product. So I'll just pick up the job that we need and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. As you can see from the concrete pad, it's only a small one. So not many fastenings needed. So nice and easy for the boys. Classic Brendan just laughing up the front. Gotta have the trusty ute, you know. Got to have a lot of supplies you need to fit in the back. But like I've said before, guys, if you ever need anything, come down and see the guys at Connect. Tools, whatever, they'll help you out. They always help us out. But yeah, we'll see you on site next week when the build starts. Hey guys, just down at Metalcraft. You would have seen before, we were just down at Connect picking up the fastenings. So we're just down here at Metalcraft checking out the kits on site, making sure they're all good. Um, this is where they actually run all the roofing component of the shed. So all the cladding, the roofing iron, the flashings, the gutters, the ridge, everything you really need apart from the structure. So yeah, when we get to site, you'll be able to see one of these dropping off your shed. But yeah, we'll head over and check out the structure. All right guys, so this is the Stokes kit here. This little pallet will hold all your brackets and everything. As you can see, it comes nice and wrapped up. It's quite a small little pallet, but very, very important. And then all the rest of it is the structure for the actual shed. So these are gonna be a mixture of jams, columns, uh, rafters. And then you can see these top hats here. They're more for the side girts and the purlins on the roof. So yeah, it's gonna be awesome to see this on site on Monday and the build starting on Tuesday. So keep watching and you'll see the whole process get unfold in front of you. G'day guys. We're out here today on site with A1 Bobcats. Uh, they're the masters of concrete. Get them to do a lot of our concrete pads. What they're doing today is a pour. They're doing it all barrowing it in. If you have a look in here, what they're doing is just working their way around the edge and pouring the footing in first. This guy here is just tapping it down, making sure there's no air bubbles in there and that, that concrete's sitting right down. So as you can see, boxed it all up. They've levered, all, levered it all out, strung line it, made sure the pad's nice and square, and gotten that all set up. They've got reinforcing mesh all through it. When you do your reinforcing mesh, you want it sitting up off the ground a little bit, so they've got these little plastic top hats there to keep it up. And then through the outside for the footing, they've got steel reinforcing bar running the whole way around. Look at that beautiful barrow work. He's just poured it exactly where he's wanted it. None over, none too far in. Just fantastic. Real nice consistency from um, the concrete company here. Their beautiful big red truck. They've got a couple of guys on site learning the tricks of the trade today. So what they're gonna do is just get it all in there first and then they're gonna do their finishing. If you have a look also, they've laid down black plastic and this black plastic's to stop ground moisture rising up and into your concrete pad. So obviously if you're getting the professionals in, they know what they're up to, they know what they're about, they're going to do all of this. If you're going to have a go at yourself, there's just a few of these things that you want to think about. Getting your boxing square, nice and level, plastic down to stop moisture. And under that plastic they will have put sand down and compacted that sand so they've got a really nice base to work from. So uh, yeah, it's pretty cool if we ever walk around. You can see in there, they've got their uh, steel reinforcing and their mesh, they've tied all their mesh together so it can't pull apart while they're having to walk on it to pour it. 
but also while you're pouring the concrete in, it's not going to pull apart at all. They've got nice big laps on it as well, so this is going to be super strong. Run your car over it, do whatever you want in there, you know, as we say, you do anything in a shed. So um, you want to build it so you can just do absolutely anything. There's pretty much nobody out there working harder than a concreter. They're pouring barrows. You know, they work hard, they party hard, that's what they're about. And uh, you only get one go at it, you know? There's no mucking around. You gotta pour it, you gotta finish it, you gotta get it all going. Our old mate over here is about to um, start up this tool. Quite uh, quite big, might, might, may arouse a few people. Whew, hard work, bit out of breath pushing those barrows. These guys, you know, tough fellas. But as you can see, they're finishing it as they're going. We've got our mate here, he's just evening it all out and then he's got his big long float and he's floating that over the top to get it really nice and level. And they're just starting to really work the top of the concrete to get all of it nice and even and just a really beautiful finish. Really makes you appreciate seeing it like this, how much work goes into it. And look, they're not stopping for a coffee. There's no breaks. Once you start, it's all go until you're done. So uh, it's really cool to see it. Then almost there, a few more barrows in there. As your arms get tighter, the distance you gotta push them gets a little bit less. So that's, uh, that's always good. But uh, yeah, almost done. It's looking good. So the guys have got it to this level. The, you've seen it, they've poured it all, done it all. And now what they're waiting for is the concrete just to harden a little bit. And then they're going to go through and trowel all the edges nicely and then start hand troweling it. And this is where the art of concrete really starts to come in. They're going to hand trowel it to bring the fines up and just get a really nice smooth finish. So although that main part of it was less than an hour to do, they'll be here for another good three or four hours finishing the edges, forming doorways, hand troweling, and just getting it absolutely perfect. So you can appreciate with something like this, they've only got one chance to do this, and they're gonna do as good a job as they can. Sometimes you're gonna get a few little imperfections because it's not a machine, you know? It's, you're dealing with the elements of whatever's going on that day, and everything else. So, you know, it's really amazing the finishes they get. You know, look, uh, something to really appreciate when you have your concrete floor done. It's a real work of art. G'day guys, Mark here from Waikato Sheds with Andy from Feature Build. Hey Mark, how are you going? <laughs> I'll try that again. Yeah. No way, yeah. keep that in. Right. Great stuff. <laughs> Caught him off guard. Yeah, it got me right there. Um, yeah, we're here building this little six by six um today and over a couple of days it will take more than a day but it'll probably only take five minutes on a video yeah so um started having a look through all the gear that we're going to be using and we got out our 30 meter tape and we've made sure that the pad's nice and square a1 bobcats has done an awesome job and it's perfect square as so that makes life easy when you're starting uh, starting your build from the base, that it's all been done right. Then we've gone along and set a 100mm line in on the sides and chalky that in so that we know where we're going to place our portal. So um, next step, build some portals as we go along with this one. This is a great little size if you're going to be a kit set client and you wanted to buy something and build it yourself. We're going to go through on this one step by step and explain everything you need to do to be able to do that. We'll show you a few different tools that you need and uh, everything else. And also at the end of it, Andy's going to line the inside of it. So we'll be able to show you how to line it with ply and do all of that. Yeah. So now what we're just starting to do is go through our materials. So we've got the plans out. We'll be looking at the bomb, which is the bill of materials there we are the plans and start okay what are our legs what are what is everything and then start if we don't need something I like to move it off to one side so it's not in the way so you have a nice clean building site to work with and then what we want is our far end wall first and we're going to build that up 
and then we're going to build our middle and our other end and then we're going to be able to stand these up. On a build this size we're going to be able to stand them by hand, we're not going to get a truck in to do it, so that you'll see that as we go through. Otherwise if it was a bigger build we'd use a high ab usually to get that done. We're just going through now and um, putting everything out on the pad so that we know where it all is but then we can get it everything we need and then we're just going to start building our frames. So by doing this it lets you know where everything is obviously but it also just gets you familiar with it all because as a kit set it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. You've got the plans but then the more you familiarise yourself with it the more it makes, starts making sense in your head so it's often good just to start placing it out and working that out. Now as you can see we've laid, roughly laid out our first portal and then we're getting our um, apex brace here and we're going to set that in and just loosely bolt it up and then we'll loosely bolt in our um, knee braces. Once we've got it all loosely bolted in we'll be able to make sure our frames square before we do the final tighten on them. Bolting these plates together on these they have punchings, a uh, punching's just the hole that they've made in the factory in it. They've got it on both sides so it just means that they can go around different ways so don't worry about that. There's some, there are a few more punchings than there are holes, doesn't matter but just you take your time and work out which way it all goes round and then just start bolting that all up loosely and then uh, We'll have these eave purlin brackets on here and this is to hold the eave purlin that runs along the top and they're just going to bolt on there like that and they're sitting up at 100 mils so you have your top hats on and then this is sitting up to hold the gutter line and your last fixing for your roof so we're just going to put those on now but then as we go we'll just readjust those to get everything spot on. Putting hold down brackets on, they all come pre-drilled so I'm just loosely um, bolting those on and then when we stand it up and level everything up we'll tighten those up and drill down and into the ground and put our diner bolts through there. So now we can go through tighten up our bolts and then we know once we stand this up that because it's square our walls are going to be plumb we'll double check that as we go but if you start with it out of square so it's like that it's just you're never going to get your shed right so important piece to check about to put my screws in so I know where my roof purlins are going to go so once we've stood it we can put our roof purlins in so on the plans it's just got from here as zero and then I've got my 751, 17, 19 measurements up so I'm just going to put my tape measure on the end there come up 751 and put a little mark and then I'll go up and do the same again and again. Get my square, put a mark, and then I'm gonna put a roofing screw into there. So when I slip my purlin on, that's just gonna hold it into position, and then I can screw that in. So that's all just in the uh, plans there to let you know where to allocate those two. Because it's such a little shed, we're just gonna have a go standing them by hand. Uh, obviously any bigger you'd be getting a high ab in or a crane truck but we'll just stand it up we're going to put some bracing in get this one nice and braced then stand the next one and start putting the shed together <laughs> there it goes see how that you've got a good hold of that yep a few Cool. Cool. Go. 
I beat that. Cool. I'm just now marking the centre of my middle bay. So this shed six metres, three metres into the centre. Have you seen, we've stood that and supported it. Now we're going to stand the next centre one and we'll start adding top hats into it to make the structure more solid. Stand up the end and do the same again. So uh, yeah, that's just what we're doing here. Obviously when we first marked out the pad, we could have marked this out at the same time. Uh, so if you do it that way, that's not bad either, but um, just having a nice centre mark and thickening up my 100mm um, 100 100mm line here so I know exactly where my leg's going to fit into. Just like that. Beautiful. Pretty level. So now I'll just jump up and we'll put one up on the top. It's starting to look more like a shed. A nice little tip for these top hats, especially if they've been out in the rain, they're quite, they can be quite hard to get apart. So the end of your hammer gets them apart really easily. Well, what we've done here is rolled the stack over and then it's much easier to pull them out. So that's just one of the things to know. It makes it way easier to work with them. Or if you need to move a few, you can pick them up with the claw of your hammer. So, uh, yeah. Another really essential tool is some of these C clamps. I've got an all mine from um, the tool barn in Morrinsville. Great guy, pop in there and check them out. But just able to clamp things together while you're working on it to get it all level and right but also holds it in place while you're putting your screws in so you're going to need a couple of pairs of those to build a shed and that's it you're building a beautiful shed treat yourself you're going to need a few tools a tech gun clamp measuring tape a few bits and pieces and a few things that you might not have but well worth spending that little bit of extra money and getting yourself a few of the good tools if you're doing yourself
after that strap racing, you see I've done those two bays, it's four screws at each end of your strap racing to have that nice and secure. So that's all done now, we're pretty much coming to the end of day one on this build and it's good to have that strap racing in. We've got a lot of the top hats in so the structure's really solid to leave for the night then tomorrow we'll come and finish up the rest of the structure. G'day guys, um, on this video it's all about how to lay a roof. It's been brought to my attention that I've been calling the ridge, capping it, the barge the whole time. A little slip you know there, but uh, so just when I'm referring to the barge I actually mean the ridge when we're doing the soft edge, all of that, that's the ridge. Barges run up the side, and uh, we'll be doing that in the next video, how to do all the flashings. Also, if you're building one of these kit sets, when I'm referring to my 100mm string line on this one, that's because we're using 100mm top hats on it. If you're building a bigger shed, it might be 120s, it might be 150s. So you're just going to want to take note of what your top hat size is before you put your chalk lines on your pad to mark out where your columns are gonna go. Awesome, enjoy. G'day guys, uh, just a bit of a rundown of what we got up to yesterday. We've formed our roller door, doorway. So what we've done is checked the plans, got the measurement, measured the center of our building, and then split the difference, and we've put marks on our ground right where we want it to go. We've then gotten our legs and positioned and bolted them down and then brought them up to the top. And in at the top you can see the mullion fixing bracket we've used. So it's an L plate bracket like this, a mullion fixing bracket, a 150 and we've attached it to the top of the C section. We've put the c-section up, marked it, cut it with an angle grinder and then we've attached that plate in and essentially what we've done is set this 100mm back from our concrete pad and then levelled it up and that's 100mm back from the other c-section and then that's allowed us to put that in and then put our top hats in as well. So we've done that, you'll notice I haven't put my bottom top hat in yet because I need to put my piece of vermin flashing in first. But I need wanted to have my door in so I know where I'm going to stop my vermin flashing and we'll go over that in a bit more detail later on. If we come inside, so this is the header for our roller door. We've used mullion fixing brackets again and we've attached those with a few tech screws, lifted it up into position and then tech screwed it from the inside. We will chuck a couple more tech screws in this. The apprentice has put these a little bit low, so we're gonna move these up a little bit higher. Just sometimes the roller door people find that they get in the way of the roller door when it's running up your tracks and in, but that's no biggie. We'll just whip them out and change it round. And as you can see, we've done the same thing here. We've got these smaller brackets on the bottom that we've put right to the far side so your roller door track will be able to fit in there and they don't interfere with it at all. So we've got all that formed up. We've then got an our header flashing here and we've measured it, folded down the sides and put that in. So then when we start cladding the front, we're going to have a line to bring our sheets down to. Um, and then the other big thing is, started to do the roof. So yesterday we got the mesh on, and how we did this is on the C-section here, the Eve Perlin, I've gone through and every 300 mils I've put a cladding tech screw, cue photo up here later, and I've put those every 300 and that works out for the spacing of your mesh. So you do that both sides of the building, you then run your mesh over and you can hook your mesh onto it all and then tighten those down and that holds your mesh in place. Your mesh is there really as a safety precaution so that while you're roofing you can't fall through the roof and it does help keep the paper up, but the paper is self-supporting, but it's really a safety measure. If you have a clear light 
clear lights on your roof and you're walking over and happen to step through one, that would save you. So then we're going to do the roofing. I'll put my harness back on in a minute and we'll get back up there and show you some of the roofing, uh, just tips and tricks, and uh, go from there. Part of the process of doing your roof is stop ending your sheets. On a corrugated iron roof, you could just use a little pair of um, mouldy grips or whatever they're called, um, or an adjustable spanner. And what you're doing, I've got a little line on mine there, because I'm just going to put them in and then fold that up. And if I had gone too deep, the fold would be above the top of the tin and then that would interfere with my ridge cap when I put my ridge cap on. So you just want to work that out, put a little line and then you're just going to stop in the top of, this is for the top of my roof, every one. And this is just going to stop in a really bad storm, water getting blown up the roof by uh, wind and hitting here and now it will hit here and then it will just be able to roll back so it's just giving a bit more protection from the elements so you go through and do every one of those you can do this on the roof but it's easier um, just to do it on the ground and then pass them up but then you don't do your last one because your next sheet's going to overlap onto that and that would interfere with it. When you've done this, you also just need to cut off the corner of your the lap because that corner would hit into there on your next sheet. So just cutting off a little bit of the corner. So just using my reds there to cut that off. Another thing is once you've worked out your sheet length and placement on your roof, you're going to have a bottom row of screws to go in. So what we like to do is mark those before we put up the sheet. So I got my set square or adjustable square and set that to 120 mils, which we've worked out as getting our bottom row of screws right into the right position. And then just go through and mark each one of those. Just a little pencil mark. I'm obviously a mill out. And just mark each one of those. Um, on the bottom row, we're going to screw every one. And then I'll do a pattern going up, which we'll show you once we're up on the roof. So they're just a few little tricks um, to make roofing go a bit smoother and a bit easier. All right. So on this job, we've decided to use a harness because it's just a really little job and because we're filming it to do um, how-to videos and things, we want to just get through it reasonably quickly. So I've opted instead of getting it fully scaffolded, we're just using mobile scaffold for the end and then me being up on the roof, I'm going to have my harness on. I have my harness tied all the time so I can't get to the edge of the roof. I can't actually fall off the roof. So I own a harness because I'm doing this all the time. You can hire harnesses from hire shops and things. So this could be an option if you're doing a kit set instead of scaffolding it all yourself. Depending on the size of the building, the sort of the bigger the shed, the easier it is to do it with scaff instead. But if you're doing a smaller 30 square metre garage or something, it's a good option. So this is just one that I've brought from Bunnings or somewhere like that and just quite a basic harness but I'll put that on and then jump up on the roof and do that. So up here on the roof and we're laying our sheet. So we've already put our first sheet on and we've gotten that really nice and square to the side of the building and also we've set up a string line down the bottom so we've set that up at a uh, hundred mil off from the edge of the eave purlin and that's going to allow for our tin to come up underneath, gutter brackets to go on and gutter to go on and we're going to have about 60 mil of roofing iron into our gutter which is perfect and then 
and then the string line is letting us know that we're square to the building with our sheets. So as we lay our sheets, if we start creeping one way or the other from our string line, we know we're coming out of parallel, so we're going to have, be able to adjust that. And that's why getting your first sheet laid correctly is so important, because if you get that a bit out, it's just going to make it a nightmare to get the rest of it. Also, we're going to go through and put our paper down. This is still a two-man job. You're going to have to get a or two-person job. You're going to have to get a, somebody out, get the wife up on the roof with you to help you lay this. What we've done is, when we've laid our first side of our paper, we've put the paper longer, and then the second side, your paper's slightly shorter. A good way to do this is roll it out on a sheet of roofing iron, and your first, your short piece of paper can be the same length as your roofing iron, and then your second longer sheet wants to be 300 mils longer than that. So you roll those out, and then take this screw out. So on the paper, you see it's got a yellow lap line, and that's where your paper laps over to. So I'll pull that piece back, put it under my knee, and then we're going to roll that down. Then Andy's going to get that, have that. He'll put in a screw. So to do this, what we're doing is just using a little uh, cladding screw and he's going to put that into the front face. Once we've attached all the bottom sheets, we're going to be able to release those and have it going into the gutter. Once Andy's got his in, I'm going to pull it tight. You're not trying to pull it too tight because you just rip it out, but you want your paper to be quite nice and taut. So I'm going to pull that to about there. And then I'm just putting my screw in at the top of it, so at the top of my top hat, so it's not going to interfere with my screw line when I screw that in. This piece is actually slightly too long. Another trick is a sharp knife, which this could be sharper. So just tucking that in like this. Then I'm going to bring that over to that side and take that screw back out. And then I'll move over to the other side and do the same thing. You can see here, if I put these screws in the wrong place, they're going to mark my sheets. So I'm just lining it up so it's going to be in the high part of my roof when the next sheet goes on. So I can just line these up and do that so I don't end up with a dent in the pan of my roof. Beautiful. All right, now we're going to pass up a sheet and lay a sheet. So we've placed that in. Andy's now getting it lined up with the sheet that's there and also checking that it's parallel to the string line. So that's good, so he's going to chuck in a screw now. I've got my foot resting on the sheet that's already secured and just onto the new sheet. I don't want to stand on that sheet till it's secured, otherwise it could slip out of the way. Then we're going to go through, put a couple more in, I'm going to start getting a line and doing my top line and screwing that off. Just tagging it as we go. And um, then we just can repeat the same process again and again. We'll lay another sheet of paper, lay another sheet of tin and just keep going. Once you get close to the other end, you can also measure back from the edge of your building to your sheet, to the edge of your sheet here or to the centre, just to make sure that you're parallel. Because if you start getting out, you're going to want to try to adjust that so your barge flashings fit better. But we might show you that when we get closer to that end. 
before we get too far, I'm going to just have a look over the side and mark where my top hat is and mark the very center of that. And then I'll do that down there so I know exactly where my screw line's going. And then what I can do on this, because I'm going to want to put a screw in, is get a chalk line. Uh, another good tool to own, handy for lots of different buildings, so worth shouting yourself when you've bought yourself an awesome shed. Hook that over. Come over here. <laughs> see where the center of that is hold that ping that and then as you can see now I've got a line so I can screw as we go and um, have a line to fix to when you're screwing off your roof I'm standing on my overlap here I've got my foot on it to hold it down tightly just start your tech screw. So there I was just pulling my finger in a little bit, not going full power to start with, because if you slip, you're gonna scratch your roof. So you just wanna get going, then once you're through, and by having the weight on my foot there, I know that I'm keeping my tin right down. Because sometimes as you screw in with your tech screw, the tin will come up the threads on it and it will sit a little bit high and you won't be perfectly waterproof. Cheers. So another couple of things to think about obviously you want a really nice still day to lay your roof. It's dangerous in the wind, sheets blowing about but it's also hard work, your paper's blowing about, everything's going everywhere so Often early mornings, the time to try to tackle a roofing job, and especially now we're coming into summer, um, it's getting pretty hot. So getting that job out of the way in the mornings a good idea. Just try to stand on your purlin lines. If you're standing in the middle of your sheets, you're likely to put a dent into them. Especially if you're a bit more weighty, you know. If you're a small fella, you might get away with it. But uh, just try to stick to your lines, and that's what's good about me. I've chalked this line. So I know exactly where I'm going to stand. After I lay this sheet, I might ping a chalk line there as well. And then I can just see exactly where I'm standing all the time. Makes it safer, just makes it a lot easier. So another job you're going to do once you've got your roof on is to get your ridge cap on. So an important part of doing your ridge cap is peeling off this little bit of plastic first, which never comes off that easy. If you get a long run of it, oh, it feels good. But you get that out your way, and then you need to fold this up. And if you just fold it straight up, you're not going to get the best fold on here, and you're not going to get the maximum coverage. So you really get your fingers under and push that up, so you're getting a tight, a tight bend on there. So you go along like that. If your fingers aren't hurting, you're not doing it hard enough. And you push it along like that, and then you can just go. So you just work your way along. And just do that, and just work your way along and get all your soft edge out before you get it up on your roof and place it into position. Awesome. We've laid our roof and we've gone to the last sheet and it's not going to be a full sheet that we need. So I've done my measurement from the centre of the underlap to the edge of the building and it's 640 millimetres. So I pull out my trusty tape measure and place that in the centre of the overlap and then mark where that's going to go to. So there, so I've because I've measured from there, that's where the centre of my overlap will sit on my next sheet. So that's how I've worked out my measurement. I've now got a mark. I'll do the same at the top. And for this, because this is going to get covered by uh, flashing, it 
wants to be a pretty nice cut, but it's not like a finished cut that you're going to see. So I can see where that is. I'm just going to use my chalk line again. Hold my chalk line. Ping that. And now I'm going to cut that. So we've got a few options to cut that. Obviously, depending on what sort of tools you have. Some people might think, oh, you could bust out the angle grinder and use the angle grinder. Of course you could, it's going to do the job. The issue with an angle grinder is it heats up as you cut, so it ruins the protective layer on your corrugated iron, so it's not the preferred method. A pair of reds and greens, imagine I had greens, you can use these. Tough work on the forearms, but you can get going. Sometimes you have to do two cuts. So now I've got my greens on me. I'll be cutting up and then doing the other cut. So cutting and then... And then by doing two cuts, I'm relieving the tin so it's easy to get my cutters in and keep cutting. Pretty, pretty hard work, but it is doable. And if that's the tools you have, you can do it. Takes a little while, but you can work your way through. What I use is a pair of Makita shears. Fantastic tool, but they're expensive. So, you know, if you're only doing one shed, you're probably not going to buy one. But hey, if you've got a mate, you can borrow them off. Or possibly have a look into hire pool or hire equip or somebody like that, and they might rent them out. I'm not sure. So, I'll show you those though. Beautiful, too easy. Finish that off and then we'll get it up on the roof. But there's a few different options that you can use to do it. And oh, there's another tool called nibblers, which I have, which are quite good. They're not as good for long cuts like this. And you can get a nibbler attachment, I believe, for a drill. So that's another thing that might be worth looking into. So we put our roof on, now we're gonna put our barge on. So what I'm gonna do is measure from the bottom of my sheet to the center of my top hat, which will go for 2990. So I have that measurement, and then I'll just do the same, check the other side. 2990 is a little bit high on that side, so we'll go 2985. So then we're going to get our barge and we're going to pull it over and we want to have a good couple of hundred mil over so once we've put our cladding on and then we've put our barges in we can cut this and get it looking just how we want to. So I'll get Andy to um, just line that up at that end. And I'll line that up there. Pretty good there. I won't stand on it because I'll slip away. My harness would have saved me. So we're good just there. So now I'm going to measure back up here. So we're going to go every screw, every second rib from our overlap. So that will be that one there. So 2990. It's just there on this, so if I go like this, nice and centre there, yep. 2990, and I want to be in the centre of that rib there. We've got that tacked on at that end, we're going to bring the barge round to this end and on this roof I'm going to have the barge, this barge, sitting on top of the other one so when you pull into the driveway, look at it, it looks like a seamless bit of uh, iron rather than having the lap coming the other way and it catches the eye a bit more.
So now what we've done is centered the other ridge in the middle and I've just stood on it and Andy's looked down it just to make sure we haven't kinked out in the middle of it at all and that it's just sitting nice and flat and we're happy with that there. So I'll pin this end here now and then we'll pin, we'll pin the other end as well. Now that I've got that all tacked off, I'm just going to bust out the trusty chalk line again and just give myself a line. And then I'll repeat that on the rest of them. And then just obviously you want to get it in the top of your rib, so really make sure you've lined up where you're going to drill through and then drill through and do that. So now that you've got your chalkies all done, what you want to do is go through and pin it more. You don't want to just start screwing off one side because you can move your whole ridge over a bit. So I'd go through, pick about the middle here, screw an overlap, screw another overlap and just do that and then start filling in as I go. <laughs> Just when you're putting your screws in, it's important not to over tighten your screws. So, so just giving it a little tickle at the end. If you do it too much and you see the edge of the rubber washer comes out, it won't be waterproof. So just pull it out and put a new one in. But uh, so you don't want to tighten them right up because it'll ruin the washers and it will uh, crinkle all your iron and won't look as good. So. Just like that and just get those in just right. So I've just blown all the swarf off the roof there. Really important to get all the swarf off the roof, those are the little iron filings, because they will cause little rust marks in it. If you do it and you happen to get caught in a shower or the roof's a bit damp and it happens, you can clean it off afterwards, but easiest is get a blower, petrol blower, blow it off. Obviously if you don't have one, at the end of doing a roof, what a lot of people do is clean the roof with a hose. And a hose, that, I've never done it, but I've heard it's quite a good way to do it, is you high pressure hose it off and just doing the same thing, getting all that swarf off the roof. But I just wanted to give that a quick blow down because I'm going to do the soft edge next. And often more swarf comes out when you do the soft edge. So this is the soft edge here. And when I put my barge flashing up, it's going to come under here. So I'm not going to start right at the end, I'll start a couple in. And what you do, I'll start this way and work towards you. You hold it there and give it a tap down with your hammer. And then move your hand along, tap the next piece down. And on the bottom of this, it has a black tar-like tape that's going to stick this down. And this is just adding another level of waterproofing. Oh, went a bit far. Another level of waterproofing. So we'd stop into the ends of our sheets, so any water trying to drive up leaves and bugs and things can't get up past this. So I'll just work my way along now and do the rest of the roof. start cladding the side of the building. Usually when you get your stacks of iron the first sheet on top will be a cover sheet so just put that to one side and then on this stack it had two little stitches sheets and they're going to be for the end of um, the front over the roller door. And then you see we've got a huge stack of sheets so they're going to be all our sidewall sheets all the same length. So we're going to get those, we're going to mark a bottom row on them and then lay our paper on the wall and start doing them. When you're laying, when you're cladding, you do it a little bit different from tin. On a roof, you're screwing through the, the top of your tin. 
we're on cladding, we're going to be screwing into the pan of it. Because of that, we want to screw next to our overlap. So that's our overlap. We want to screw there to hold our overlap down. So I've checked my measurement along the bottom and 220 mils is going to work for me. So I'll just grab the first sheet and mark 220 mils. Uh, 220, 220. If you wanted, you could work out how many sheets you have in your wall, put all those sheets together, get the ends right, and pre-drill them. It's an option, makes it a little bit easier, but obviously there's a little bit more room for error. So on this, we're just going to mark each sheet and lay them as we go. Cool. We're about to lay the paper, so we're just going to tag it at each the top and then the bottom and then roll it out making sure we've got it nice and square as we go uh, not the easiest job so you know don't judge me too much um, but if you want to judge me all you want uh, and uh, let's see how we go obviously writing on the outside of it so we'll push that up so you tag yep put a screw in there so we've just left a bit so we can take it round the corner. Oh yeah, here he's gone into the plate. Yep, beautiful, did it rip it. Oh yeah, hard out. The good thing with this paper and doing it all in one piece is because there's no joins, it's just going to work as a waterproof barrier perfectly. Not all sheds have this. If your shed doesn't have it, it's only because this shed's getting lined on the inside that uh, the customers have decided to do it. So we'll just tack that corner there now. And then we're just going to put the level on here and see how level we are. Same height there, black, really hard to see your pencil marks on. And the trick here is really try not to over tighten these. You over tighten these little screws and it's going to put a real dish into your sheet of iron and not look as nice. So just really give it a little bit of pressure on that and then if you do over tighten it, you can always just back it off a little bit. So chuck that level on. So I'm just gone through, I probably ideally should have done it at the halfway mark, but I've just marked my centre purlins so that I know exactly where they are and I'm just going to do a measurement and mark that on my sheet where I want to pin them and then once we're finished we'll go through and do a string line. But it just means that if there's any variation on your top hat, which generally there's not because it's all very straight with steel, you just know you're going to be hitting every time. So, but here I'll measure, I can do it right there, into the centre of this, 1.1, 1.5, 1 and then I'll just do the same again. So here, 
1805. 1805. There we go. So I've got those marks, I can put tech screws in and then I have somewhere to ping my chalk line to afterwards and we'll show you that in a minute. So up the top we're just pinning it right high up in the top, then the gutter's going to come over through here and cover all of that up, but just pinning it in the same spot on the sheet every time so it's all nice and uniform. Cool, uh, so now what we're doing is laying out our end wall. So on the plans, it shows they've worked out all the sheets and differing lengths to work do your end wall. So there'll be two at 3.5, one for each side of center, and then continuing down. So now what we're doing is splitting the stack up and the guys are taking it round to the other side and laying it out so we can start putting it up in the order it's meant to go. On the front, like you'd seen earlier, we had a couple of short sheets. So above the door header, they're only gonna be a 1.2, you know, coming down and then back to a long sheet. So as they get through this pile, there'll be four at the 3.2. Oh no, they're all, oh yep, there's 3.2 there. So they'll just split it all up and that lay it all out so you know exactly where it's all going before you start putting it all up. Uh, so I've just, we're going to lay this back wall now. So I've done all my measurements and checked that it's going to work and I'm just marking all my measurements on the sheet this time. So then we'll be able to put it up and screw it off as we go. So I've just double checked it in a few spots to make sure it's gonna work perfectly. I've ridden it on the wall so I can see what I've done and marked it on my tape. So we're gonna go through do that. We're also gonna cut the angle on the top of these sheets now and then put them up. But we'll also show you how you can cut them when they're up there as well. So there's a few options. So we're cutting the rake and cut for the tops of these. Uh, if you can borrow one or you're a commercial um, shed builder, set of nibblers is a really handy tool for this job. So I'll show you those. As you can see they cut out quite a lot and it's not the prettiest cut but when it's going to be up there and then have a barge flashing going over it, it doesn't need to be the most pretty cut. The other option is just back to the reds and greens, ye old faithfuls. So I'm just doing a cut away from my line to start with, just because it's a bit rougher like this. And then if I want to do a nicer cut, I can just take a bit more time, cut up with my red, my greens. I'm never, I'm not closing my snips completely till the end of the cut. Um, every time you close them, you tend to move off line more. So you're just cutting with the back of the cutters more. So you get a lot done with a set of reds and greens. Yeah, I think for about a hundred bucks, you get a good set and well worth the money where you're going to be able to pretty much do everything on your own kit set shed with them. So, you know, probably worthwhile buying a set of those. Here, come grab the other end of that, buddy.
Here we are using the angle grinder to cut out the top half of the vermin flashing. I've made a mark on the vermin flashing 10 millimetres below the concrete and we've cut that out. Here I'm just starting to cut out the tin to set the height of my head flashing and then just trimming the side of the door away. What we're doing is forming the doorway here and I'm going to start installing my J-track and my little piece of the top hat here that my J-track will sit over. Here we're just cutting out the excessive J, uh, the excess J-track that we need. So just going through there and carefully cutting that all out. And now I've got my J-track and I'm just installing that just obviously I'm going to have to cut the top to the right size so I'm going to mark that now and then install that in. Just putting my marks on that and I'm going to do the angled cut so that fits in snugly to the top pearl in there. There we are, I've cut that out and I've fitted that in and it's fitting really nicely. I've got to get that behind those small top hats so it's just taking a little bit of force to put it in there. Here I'm just going through and I've put in the rest of my J-Track and I'm just wrapping all my paper around. Now the joinery's arrived, heavy bits of joinery, this double glazing, so we're just carrying that through. I'm going to leave that on the floor, just up off block, so the edge of the joinery doesn't get damaged at all. The city glass has supplied all this joinery, and they do a fantastic job. Um, when you first get your kit set, you might notice that there's no head flashings for your joinery. They get supplied with the windows. Here, we're just slipping this in. Here we're using a plate very carefully just to pop the head flashing cool. to move it up to push the head flashing in and marking my screw line to um, keep my head flashing tight down onto the window. Here we go, so we've got in this first piece of joinery into the shed and uh, we've sat it in there, it's a nice snug fit so it's not going anywhere but you're going to use these joinery screws. So that's what these packs are for, joinery screws. So because I'm going to have to take this door back out once I get flashings to put the flashings in, I'm just going to tack it in a couple of positions. So I'm just going to screw one up here and one down the bottom for now. That's going to hold it in securely and then I'll do it on the other side. Obviously when I fully screw that, I'll make sure it's pulled in completely, but because this is just a temporary tacking, I'm just going to chuck a couple of those in. Not enough wheat picks this morning. Have to get the old trusty step ladder on the job. So now the next step will be installing the window. We've fully lined this end of the shed, which is how you usually do it. And I've now marked out on my top hat how big my window is. And I'm going to go through and cut these out. So I'm just carefully cutting through both sides of this. And I've removed that. I've then drilled from the inside out, marking holes in the four corners of my window. I usually do this slightly smaller than my window size and then cut it out and then from there I can get a perfect measurement and just make that hole a bit bigger. I'm cutting the paper away, leaving a bit of excess so that can be pushed around. What we're doing here is cutting our J-track for the window. So this piece, the tongue, I want to extend to the bottom here. Then this will sit over here come down that face and down. So what I've done is measured that, measured up, put my mark, measured the depth down, measured to there, then I've squared across and I know that that's 55 mils difference. So I've put a mark there and then 
done on angle across and down. So now I'm going to cut up here, cut this all out, and then I'll be able to sit it in. And if it's not perfect, you can always just recut it a little bit. But we'll get that in there, that will sit, that will sit over there, and then up to the top. And that will form the first side for my window. I'll form my other side, and then I'll get a bottom in, and then be able to do my top. So we'll cut that now and go from there. So here I am installing my bottom sill and screwing that into position. When I put my top sill or header in, I put that in but I don't screw it off until I've got my window in position. This makes it easier to get your window and header in and also means that you can get a nice snug finish by pulling that down and into position once you're ready. Here we are, just carefully pushing the window in. Definitely good two-man job, this, to push it in. And here again, we're popping our head flashing in. As you can see, I've left all my screws out on the tin above that to give me the maximum flexibility to pop in the window. Here, we're just tacking the window back in again. And now I'm pulling down my top piece of J-Track to position that and screw that into position. I've just used a ruler to keep it the same distance off at both ends and uh, put a couple of tech screws into that to hold it into position. Here I'm getting my setting the height for my screws so I can screw through my tin, through my head flashing it and into the J-Track behind holding it in. Hey, so today we're um, going to finish up this little 6x6 shed we've been doing and we're doing the flashings. The other day I went round and ordered all my flashings, I've already put this one on. You'll have seen it in other videos, but just a quick rundown of how we do flashing or ordering a flashing. Put a square edge like this across where your flashing's going to go. And then from that point, measure to where you want your flashing to go. So on this one, I've wanted it to return into the bit of the um, sheet of iron, so I've measured that, 145 mils, and then done the same on the other side. And then what I often do is with a vivid, just write where it is, the sizes, so then when I get all my flashings turn up, I measure my flashings, write it on those, and then it's easier to allocate to it. You often think at the time, oh, it'll be easy, I'll know where it all goes, but a week passes and they all look the same. So we've popped that one on, so today we'll just go through how to do a barge flashing, how to finish your ridge cap flashing, corner flashings and window flashings, and then the same process is basically the same for every other one. So we'll just go through a few tips and tricks with that, and um, yeah, come on over. So I've got my flashing on the ground ready here and the first measurement I'm going to want is this measurement up behind the gutter here. So I'm just going to jump up my trusty ladder, hook that there and it's just going to come up behind the gutter there so 2740 will be work. And that's on my short side, 2740, so I'll make a mark there. As you can see, I've only ordered my flashings a couple of hundred mils longer than they need to be. And that just gives me the opportunity to cut it down and fit it just how I want it. So 
So then I'm just using my reds and greens, as you've seen through the shed. There's pretty much you can build a whole shed with these as far as cutting goes. Some people might think, oh, why don't you use an angle grinder? An angle grinder will heat up the paint and ruin the protective layer, where these, as they cut, they fold it back over and keep that protective layer, so they're the best option. I'm just doing a cut away from my line first, and then cutting my line there. I know I don't need any of this extra top on this side, so I'm just going to cut that out of my way. So now for this next cut, I'm going to put this into position. up and under there, that's sitting and now I just need to hat mark this to cut off the top. So this is going to get covered by the barge flashing afterwards. So I'm just going to cut that off pretty much at the same line of the roof. So mark up there. Just remembering when you're using your reds and greens, the side of the tin that you don't want to keep, your big bottom jaw stays on that side, so it's your waist side. So there we go, so that's in position now. Then I'll go down, get the bottom to fit snugly on. Get that grass out of there. So it just fits like that. As you can see, when I've measured this piece of my flashing, if you measure on a rib here, that's about 35 mils. I've made those 30 mils, because they don't need to be touching into that edge, and then it stops rubbing and marking your tin. So I'm just using tech screws to hold these into position. Obviously, I'm going to have to go through and take this plastic off. So if I just line my screw up and my wall in this screw up and do that. You can also use rivets. Some people like tech screws in the look, some people like rivets. If you use rivets, just drill a hole and pop your rivets in. I'm just going to hold that in position now, pull all this plastic off and go through and screw that all off. Sometimes if your tech screw's not going in, they just get a little bit of steel built up on the end of them. And if you keep trying to force it, it ends up cutting a bigger hole than you want. So just back it out, let the little bit of swarf come off, and then send that home. If you decide, okay, no, I want to rivet this, you can use a tech screw, over screw it slightly. And that will leave your hole big enough for a rivet to pop in. And then just pop your rivet in there. And um, you have a nice tidy finish on that as well. So that's how you've done a corner flashing. Pretty easy and straightforward. Uh, and then we're going to go on next and do the barges and show you how to do those cuts. So we're going to fit our barge flashings now, so same thing, just worked out what size they all are to allocate them to the four corners. I'm going to slip it up and under my ridge and then we'll work out the centre cut and then do the cuts around the gutter. So I'll probably slip it up first past a little bit and just cut it out of the way of the gutter 
and then we'll um, go from there. Alright, so we're going to work on the end of our barge flashing at the moment. Obviously, when you're working with tin, you're trying not to scratch it, but it does scratch reasonably easy. We always give you some black touch-up paint for this, so try not to, but if you do, just give it a touch-up afterwards and it'll be good as gold. So here, I'm going to have to cut a piece this off here to get it to sit down into my gutter but I want to have leave enough to fold a tab back round so I'm going to do that now so what I'm doing is you can extend your roller and get a good line along the bottom edge of your tin I'm going to mark that and then I'm going to want to do a 30mm fold down so I'm going to mark 30mm here 30 mil here. I, if you have a look in the end here, there's always a bit of a gap between your flashing and the end of your gutter, so I'm going to also do a fold round into there. So, what I don't want to do is cut this whole way, otherwise, that's going to not be in the right position. So, if I hold that, it's about 50 mil there. I'm just going to put a mark there and there. And then if I mark If you pull your plastic off, it is easier to mark with your pencil, um, but each to their own a little bit with that. So obviously when I do this fold down, this piece of the tab is not going to be there. So I'm going to cut that on my tin line, and then cut that there, fold that up. See, so now I'm getting a better idea of exactly where it's all fitting. So seeing like that's pretty good. Here I'm going to have to cut back a little bit of an angle like this, just so when that folds down it doesn't interfere with the gutter. And I will cut off this extra piece of my tab here. my folding pliers, a pair of those is essential if you're building a lot of sheds. If you were doing only one you might get away with hand folding it over but ideally a set of um, these are worthwhile. Just doing a little bit of a bend, moving along a little bit more. There we are, so that's folded down. It's going to stop birds being able to get up and under the end of your barge. If you don't have that fold down, it is more likely you're going to be able to get birds coming up and into that, which we don't want. So now what I want to do is just pin this um, back into position. That's just going to hold that now while I work out the rest of this flashing. What I want is a plum cut to follow the edge of my gutter down. So for this I'm going to actually peel off my, peel my plastic back. So 
So I could put a square mark across from where my gutter line is. And then holding this and getting my bubble level. It's given me a nice plum cut down there. Obviously though, I am gonna to wanna to fold this tab round to block off this end. So what I'm gonna do is just do another plum cut about 50 mil, so pretty much right to the very edge on this one. See, if you don't get your cut the whole way through, you can just manipulate the tin backwards and forth and it will break off. So now I've got that folded right round. And I wasn't able to finish this cut before, but now that's out of the way I can. And now I'm going to have this little tab folded under here. screw into there. It's just going to stop anything being able to get up into there. So that's that all folded, that's folded, a nice cut down like that. Yeah, perfect. Now we'll just do the other end. Usually what we do to hold this piece down is on every lap we put a screw through here and hold those into position and then one at the very end. So for right now I'll just put one in here. Cool. Cool. So now what we're going to work on is getting the centre of our flashing right. So when they both come up, they meet in the centre and look spot on. So similar to what we did down that other end, two things. I'm going to get that out the way first and I'm going to plumb my line down but I don't want the two just to butt into each other I want the one to go over the top of the other one so generally when I do this I just think about what side you're going to see the most so on a shed like this you're going to drive in this way so I'll have this one sitting over the top of that one so it doesn't catch the eye as much. So what I do want is an overlap of about 10 mil. So I can just go, just go 15 there and um, have a line down here. Like this.
So now as you can see, I'm gonna to have to do my same plum cut down here to get these up closer to being in position. I've done my plum mark, I'm gonna cut that now. I've got Reese just to hold the end of the flashing, otherwise it's easy for it to slip off the roof. So it's always, when you're doing bits like this, good to have a buddy round. And then just on this top corner here, I'm just cutting that ed the little corner there off because when we've stop ended our sheets, when we did our roof, that is going to hit into the stop end. So just like we'd cut it off on our sheets, we're doing that again there. Right, we'll just slip this up now. So we've got a pretty good line there. Just how our bottom two flashings are fitting is not perfect. So I'm just going to mark here. Cut that off. All these flashings are made by people not the machines, the machines haven't taken over yet. Um, so look, there's always going to be slight imperfections in them. So I just bent that so it sits nicely. The two bottoms don't match up perfectly. So I'm just going to cut smudge it off. And down below you won't notice. But I do want to come over. See, I'm not at right in the center of my rib, so I do need to come over a bit further. Let's slip it up a little bit more. There we go. So we've got that into the centre. I'm just going to put a tech screw there to hold that for the time being, and then I'll replace that with a rivet. So now we've got our two barges on, we've got our middle nicely done. It's time to do this end, and this is why we've left this long. So one of the first things I'm going to do is project the line of the barge up onto my ridge. Like this on both sides. I'm going to want to keep this piece of the roll to start with. So I'm going to mark along like this. Everybody does these a little bit different. Some people might leave a square finish there. Some people will come down and do a bit of an angle back. I like to come down and do a bit of an angle back. So I'm gonna come down 50 mil, put a mark, and then I'm gonna come in 20 mil from the edge, and then project my line across like this. And then make everything uniform, do the same on the other side. So I'm just lifting the tin up and my snips up so that I'm not rubbing against the flashing the whole time and putting scratches into it. So 
Sometimes it is actually easy to be up on the roof to do this. So just whatever feels comfortable for you when you're doing it. There's a double fold on this bottom edge, so it's quite hard to get your initial cut through. Once you get that, you're away laughing. Now I'm going to mark up my rolled edge a little bit, we're talking probably 20 odd mil, and cut up that. If you wanted you could, you can release a lot more screws in your ridge and then it's going to give you a bit more flexibility to pull and work on this as you do it. Now I'm just starting to flatten this out, I need to cut up it a little bit further. I'm just going to put So now I've got my plate flat, I'm going to line up the centre there and then come just below my corner there, same on this side. I'm going to replace these for rivets on this but to start with I'll just put a texture in to hold that into place. And now I want to round this edge off here, sort of a bit like that. Now I'm going to put a couple of cuts into here. And then I'll grab my hammer and I'm going to hammer these down. Cool, and that seals up the end of that. On this, if water gets in, water's going to come down, run out the roof. So you don't really need to silicon it if you were wanting to and if it was for a habitable um, you can run some beads of silicon down here and down here and then just screw that off and that's going to keep it even more watertight, big bead of silicon. Which I will do afterwards but it's a messy job so it's not nice to do when you're on camera. But that's pretty much the basics of how you do your ridge your end of your ridge and all the rest of it. Cool, so we've got the PA door, we've taken that back out and we've got our flashings on the ground. So obviously it's similar to a roller door in that your flashing's gonna stop here and then come down onto your vermin. So we've already started cutting one. So that's just going to fit in like this. Obviously this is um, what we call the Shannon flashing. 
and how that works is we've measured it, it's the same depth as the rib on your T-rib, it's got a fold, comes back like this. So instead of having to have a flashing that came the whole way over here, really big, having to have the head flashing come the whole way through, we've just done two of these that look exactly the same, so it's nice and symmetrical on it, and it's going to keep any water out. So we'll pop that in like that, we'll rivet it into the doorway here, and then we'll put some screws in on the lines there to hold this in. When we put the PA door back in, we will use some compressible foam, and we'll run compressible foam down both edges of the door. So when that door gets pushed in and screwed off, that compressible foam's making it a watertight finish onto your flashings. The head flashing at the top stopping all your water coming down, and then you've got a sealed building. Cool, so now we're going to do our window flashings. So we've had to pop our window back out, and I'm going to start with my bottom flashing first. Obviously important that when you've cut all the bottoms that none of this tin's going to get in the way of it. So this piece here I might just trim down a little bit more. And then what I want is this flashing's going to come down and sit over the top of that one. So I'm going to extend this past and I'm going to fold my corners up. So that will be my first thing to do is get a measurement. So it's not going to come past there, so 70 mils is fine. So if I mark 70 millimetres there. Square up. I'm going to put a square line across the top here and then do a 30 mil turn up. So then I'll mark... 30 mils there. So I've got my upstand there now. Now I need to get a measurement for the window. 17.15. Mark from there. And then I'm just going to mirror what I've done on that side on this side. We've got that set in there, I'm just going to put a couple of tech screws in to start with to hold that into position. I will have to change these to rivets, otherwise they'll get in the way of the window. The good thing about using tech screws to start with is that if you do need to take it back out to change something, you're able to just unscrew it and redo it. So now we're going to get our flashing which I've made both of these flashings the same size so that it yet again looks uniform onto the build. So I've taken my measurement from the top of my head flashing to the bottom of here. 
and I've marked that and then I'm going to cut away this excess. So I obviously need to cut this off because it's a little bit long but also I need to cut it back to there. Measure that which is 10 mils. So now I've got that sitting in position how I want it, I am going to decide here how I want to finish this. So either we could do a full cut like this, but I think that will look a bit sharp on this. So I'm just going to do a little cut across there just to give it a little bit of an angle. We go 50 mil up, mark there, pull my plastic away. So that's the bottom, and then I'll cut this off. There we are, little finish there, I'll clean that up and we'll rivet that on and then tech screw that into position. Do the same on the other side and then we'll be able to slip the window back in. Cool, so we've got our flashings in for our window and now we just need to um, put some of this foam on. It's, it's actually not double sided. So, but one side is sticky. So if you get that, and just, it just ugh, goes on the very edge of your window. So the top doesn't need it, just the two sides. Just before you put your window in, take the white tape off the underside of it. It's just there to stop the tape sticking to itself when it's in its big roll. Cool. Let's go on bottom first. Beautiful, yep. You can let that go now. That'll hold in there. So now we've got that in there. I'll put a few more screws back into my head flashing and then we'll push that in tight and screw that in. So once that's all done, your window's pretty much fully installed. You'll also see we've supplied you eco foam. And the eco foam is to come up and under here. So how that works is, see this piece here, I'm going to have to cut. So I'll just put myself a mark there like that. Get my Stanley knife. 
cut that off. And this is just going to stop our uh, birds or predominantly just birds or when you're cleaning up if you spray the hose up that's going to stop any water going any higher than that and then here these two pieces just join together like this and then I'm going to cut that end as well in line there I usually just push it up, sort of, about there. And then, either rivet, rivet to tech screws. And just do that every second one, and that's going to hold the foam up there and keep that all in. So that's your window in. Obviously put my tech screws back in the top push the window, have somebody pushing on the window to compress that foam, put the screws in and then that's going to hold it in place and then a tech screw or a rivet there to hold that down, perfect, your window's done. Oh, hey friends, I'm just here on the shed, you've been along on this adventure with me and I've just come back to reminisce on just what we've done, what we've got up to and just have a look at it all complete in all its glory. It's been great having everybody come along with us on this and being able to explain everything as we've gone. Obviously if there's anything in these videos, if you're a Kitset client and you'd like a bit more detail or to see it sort of done differently let us know in the comments and we're always happy to make new videos for you explaining things and just trying to refine our process because what we do here at Waikato Sheds is you, we're here for the whole process from the concrete the whole way up so any questions you have we're happy to help answer those and just make the whole process as seamless as possible so yeah i mean and look at this it's come up just beautifully the black on black on black just looks fantastic with all of it so we're really happy with this one so we'll just have a little walk around waikato doors with the sectional door looks fantastic all new zealand color steel we only use New Zealand colour steel, so it's the best quality you can get. All locally manufactured and made, and all locally guaranteed. So you know that if you ever have a problem over the lifetime of it, they're going to be able to sort that out for you. Connect fastenings for all our fastenings and bolt. Marley downpipes and colour steel gutters. Just everything on that. It's just all the best stuff with the best quality service you can ask for. City glass for our aluminium joinery, like this, beautiful. They've gone double glazed on this here. It's gonna be a home gym, this little um, setup. So they wanna be nice and comfortable in there while they're working out. Obviously we can just do single glazed if you want it just for a bit more of a shed. But you know, we've got all the options there. Beautiful, slide it open. So obviously as you go round, you know we've done some different styles of flashings on things. So if you're ever not quite sure about what you're doing there, if you're doing a kit set, just let us know and we can talk through all of that with you. Another nice bit of joinery gone in here. Eco foam up in there, just beautiful. It's just really come up really nice. Important thing with your sheds is you do need to clean them from time to time, just like you'd clean your car. Give it a wash down, and um, with the warranty on all your color steel, you do need to clean them to keep that warranty all up to date. So, well worth just giving them a wash every once in a while. I was talking to a Kitsi uh, client the other day and he'd just given it a wash and he couldn't believe how nice and bright it had come back up just looking like new again. So well worth in protecting your investment doing that. Oh, pop in. It's 
So this client's going to line this all in plywood. We've got Andy from Feature Build who built that with me. He's going to line all that for us. So it's just going to look awesome. Going to put nice thick gym mats down onto the concrete and have just an awesome gym. And you can imagine with these windows doors open, the big sectional door open there, it's just going to be an awesome space. The sectional door is uh, insulated, so that's quite a good thing to think about when you're putting them in. When, if it was just a garage, it doesn't matter, but when you want to control that temperature more, having an insulated sectional door is really worthwhile. And then just all our beautiful New Zealand steel everywhere in here, super strong and durable. So it's awesome, awesome for coming along on this journey with us all and just you know, get in contact with Waikato Sheds for all your shed needs. And uh, until the next video, see you later.